The Nobel Prize for Literature between 1982 and 1988 went to authors from Africa for the first time, the writer of The Lord of the Flies, some prolific novelists, two extraordinary dissidents from the Soviet bloc uh, towards the end of the Cold War, and many people's favourite novelist, the magical realist, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Thanks for joining me on the 120 Nobels Challenge, where I am reading every single one of the writers who've won the Nobel Prize since 1901 before the October 2024 uh, announcement of the 2024 winner. The 1982 winner was Gabriel Garcia Marquez from Colombia. He is a beloved novelist and journalist. Uh, he wrote A Hundred Years of Solitude, this book here, and Love in the Time of Cholera and Chronicle of a Deaf Foretold. He had a real genius for titles. He's known as a magical realist. In my Substack article, I explore whether that is a really a fair label for Garcia Marquez or something which is perhaps limits our appreciation of him. And I'll uh, point, uh, I'll come back to Gabriel Garcia Marquez towards the end of this video. The 1983 winner was William Golding from Britain. Uh, he was a British novelist, he was a British novelist, playwright and poet. He wrote Lord of the Flies uh, as his first novel in 1954. It was made into a famous film uh, that I remember watching as a youth in 1963 and then remade in 1990 as well as a play. And it described a book, uh, a group of boys stranded on a tropical island descending into a lawless and increasingly wild existence before being rescued. His book, The Inheritors, repeated the theme to some degree in looking at uh, trying to imagine the experience of Neanderthals encountering modern humans uh, who were, by comparison, deceitful and violent. He was part of a kind of post-World War II exploration of... Uh, I guess the inherent violence in human nature, an issue that I explored in my video on Richard Overy's book, Why War? Uh, but uh, Golding struggled to recreate the success of uh, Lord of the Flies in part because he developed alcohol dependence. He remained a heavy drinker into his 50s, uh, uh, but his story was also a story of both alcohol and recovery. Uh, until his late 50s, there were many, many stories of wild scenes with William Golding, strain, strain family relationships and diminishing productivity. Until he began to take steps towards recovery, in part inspired by Carl Jung's, uh, you know, psychology of the unconscious and exploration of dreams. Golding, as part of his recovery, kept a daily journal recording dreams and reflecting on his life. And he kept up this practice for nearly 20 years. It's provided rich material for biographers. Ultimately, it bore fruit in terms of a new set of rich novels. In 1980, he published this book, Rites of Passage, the first of his novel, uh, which was a part of a series of novels. And in this one, it describes a voyage to Australia, where I live in the early 19th century. The novel won the Booker Prize in 1980, and Golding followed up his success with Close Quarters in 1987 and Fire Down Below in 1989 in a book that was later published as one, in one volume entitled To the Ends of the Earth. Uh, as any book about Australia probably should be uh, titled. Perhaps in retrospect, Golding's uh, late life recovery should be what he is most famous for, rather than his now somewhat dated book, Lord of the Flies. The 1984 winner was Yaroslav Seifert uh, from Czechoslovakia, as it was then, uh, Czech Republic or Czechia as it is now. 
He was a Czech writer, poet and uh, journalist, wrote in that Slavic language. And in many ways, he was primarily a great national poet of the Czech language. Uh, Seifert was awarded the 1984 Nobel Prize in Literature for his poetry, which endowed with freshness, sensuality and rich inventiveness, uh, provides a liberating image of the indomitable spirit and versatility of man. Uh, his poetry is better, perhaps, than the Nobel Literature Prize's commendation of him. It is uh, written in Czech and has uh, extraordinary poetic quality qualities that use the resources of the Czech language in ways that are quite unique. Uh, and this obviously makes him hard to translate. But at the time of the prize, he was a suppressed writer under the then communist government of Czechoslovakia. He had supported the sort of liberalisation, I guess, reforms, uh, socialism with a human face, I think it was called, in the Prague Spring of 1968, which was ruthlessly suppressed by both uh, the Soviet Union and also the communist cadres of the Czech Republic. And he later then also supported the uh, Human Rights Initiative, it's Charter 77. But he began his writing in the 1920s, and uh, though supportive of socialist democracy, he was never really a supporter of the sort of repressive communism that later came to dominate Czechoslovakia. In the 1930s, he, after visits to the Soviet Union, he wrote a poem about the Moscow show trials of the 1930s that has an eerie resonance with today's world. There, in translation, he, he wrote, What you can read in the newspapers is a play not to be believed, and the scenes from which come horror, fear, are whispered from the prompter's box. What you can read in the newspapers is a play. Let the world amuse itself. Only the end, the smell of human blood, is unfortunately, however, genuine. In the 1930s, he also uh, wrote an elegy, a famous elegy for the great national leader Tomasz Masaryk. And, and during the 1940s, during occupied Czechoslovakia, he wrote poetry, which really established uh, Seifert as the sort of Czech national poet. Uh, but through the 1950s and 1960s, he sort of fell out of favour with the communist government, which um, assumed control of uh, Czechoslovakia after the war, and uh, defended the autonomy of art from uh, politics. He was a strong supporter of Dubček and the Prague Spring, uh, worked underground to maintain the independence of culture and, along with Vaclav Havel, supported Charter 77. As a result, his work was banned for much of the 1970s and published in Emigre and Samizdat publications, including his uh, uh, poem Morovi Sloop, translated as The Plague, Column, but he was not really a political poet. He, he was very much a master of lyrical poetry, and his celebration of the lyrical mind was something as an alternative to the rational util utilitarian thinking that um, suffused the Czech underground and was opposed uh, or opposed both, I guess, the communist. Uh, post totalitarian regime of Czechoslovakia, as well as the sort of rational capitalist thinking of the West of that era as well. In an interview, Seifert said that it is poetry which has the subtlety needed for us to be able to describe our experience of the world. The Plague Column is a great example of his bleaker poetry, where he says, where there is no consolation to bring a little comfort to your tear-stained soul. But his kind, celebratory spirit is caught better in the poem View from Charles Bridge, the Great Bridge. If you've been to Prague, you've walked across Charles Bridge. 
Uh, and any visitor to Prague can relate to this. Day after day, I gaze in gratitude on the castle of Prague and on its cathedral. I cannot tear my eyes away from that picture. It is mine, and I also believe it is miraculous. But whenever I step on the pavement of Charles Bridge, I am reminded of those pilgrims in the pilgrimage church. What bliss it is to walk upon this bridge, even though the picture is often glazed by my own tears. I hope that brings back happy memories of Prague. And uh, perhaps next time, if you haven't visited the Prague, think of uh, Yaroslav Seifert when you walk across Charles Bridge. The 1985 winner was Claude Simon from France. Uh, he was a French novelist born in Madagascar to French parents. He was captured in the Battle of Meuse in uh, World War II, escaped and then joined the resistance. And then later, in uh, after the war, he uh, developed tuberculosis and was bedridden for five months in 1951, left with uh, nothing but his memories, nothing much to do. Uh, and this led him to write the intense autobiographical um, poet, uh, novels that he wrote. They were very much autobiographical, dealt with his personal experiences, traumatic experiences in World War II, the Spanish Civil War, and his family's history. He was prolific, remorselessly <laughs> prolific, uh, and wrote a large cohesive body of work, uh, which in some ways has similarities to Proust uh, through the 1950s and 60s. This includes the books The Wind from 1950, in French, obviously, uh, 57 to 59, The Grass, The Flanders Road from 1961, and Histoire or History in, or Story in 1967. Uh, his work wasn't really imaginative, uh, but more autobiographical, perhaps if you like a French post-war version of the Norwegian novelist Carl Ove Norsgaard, who writes meticulously and obsessively about his own, his own life. The fragmented narratives that are associated with the very austere Nouveau Roman movement of the 1950s and 1960s by people like Alain Rob Grillet and Michel Boutot. Uh, but um, Simon's work is more subjective and less objective. Objectivists, the, they, those writers really sought to take all the emotion out of novels. Not really what most readers were expecting. Uh, he was seen in America as a very paradoxical choice for a very surprising choice for the Nobel Prize, one of the more notorious winners of the Nobel Prize. Uh, and the journalist Maureen Dow described his uh, victory as a joke. I'm not quite sure really who Maureen Dowd is. Maybe American writers, uh, readers, listeners or viewers can let me know whether they treat Maureen Dowd's literary judgment seriously. His writing, though, was stylistically forbidding, um, looking for neither empathy nor approval. It was a kind of unsentimental stoicism that you can understand given his and his generation's experience of uh, the extraordinary events of uh, the 1930s, 1940s and to some degree 1950s. Uh, he understandably was rather sceptical of the claim that humans can change the course of history. Uh, his books uh, feature long, multi-page paragraphs with long, Proustian or Faulkner, like William Faulkner style uh, paragraph or long sentences. For example, from Flanders Ro Road, there's a there's a almost two-page or one and a half page uh, sentence that begins. They went on arguing, their voices not even snarling, with something plaintive instead, stamped with that kind of apathy appropriate to peasants and soldiers, and somehow impersonal, like their stiff uniforms still keeping, 
it was, and then in brackets, it was barely autumn, and then those brackets go on for 17 lines, and the page carries on, the sentence carries on for one and a half lines. Uh, extraordinary stuff. In a way, his book from the 70s, I think, Triptych is more approachable in many ways. It has three stories told concurrently with little to distinguish the shifts in narratives. There's really no paragraphs, uh, but there is, um, it's, 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 it's shorter and more uh, quite intriguing in a way. It adopts some of Rob Grillet's tone of uh, objectivist description of very physical scenes. Worth a look, but I'm not going to read too much Claude Simon in the rest of my life. The 1986 winner is Wale Sawinka from Nigeria. Now, he wrote novels, plays, poetry and essays, and he also made some important political speeches or commentary on political affairs that both criticised the um, African dictatorships, particularly in the 60s, 70s and 80s, as well as commenting importantly on uh, the process of truth and reconciliation in South Africa and the question of reparations in South Africa in the 1990s. His major plays include Congi's Harvest and Mad Men and Specialists and many, many more. I had in mind when I started looking up Wale Suinka that he was a novelist, but it's really plays are his major output. But his novels do include The Interpreters and uh, The Season of Anime from 1965 and 1973, as well as another book I will tell you about shortly. Uh, he was the first sub-Saharan African, I'd say perhaps the first true African. Albert Camus was born in our, was it Alger French Algerian, so I guess he counts as African, but uh, Suinka I think is the first sub-Saharan African to win the Nobel Prize. And in the 1980s, Africa was only just emerging from decolonisation. Uh, and South Africa was still under apartheid. So it was a not insignificant point that the Nobel um, uh, Prize Committee was making in awarding Sawinka uh, the prize. Indeed, he was in that post-war period in Africa as decolonisation was handled rather ineptly by the retreating European powers in the 60s and 70s. It was marked by many, many difficulties for Africans. Sawinka himself was imprisoned in the late 1960s for resisting the military dictatorship and his prison memoirs are among his major writings. In 1971, when he wrote the play Mad Men and Specialists, he also uh, travelled to Paris to uh, act in, uh, in a play in the lead role as a play where he played the role of Patrice Lumumba, the first uh, the murdered first Prime Minister of the Republic of the Congo in uh, the production of a play, Murderous Angels by Connor Cruz O'Brien, which was actually a play about the crisis in Congo. In 1997, Sawinka gave an important set of lectures on reparations and historical forgiveness, the burden of memory. The Muse of Forgiveness, uh, and these um, explored issues such as reparations. And in September 2021, he published Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People on Earth. This is the novel I referred to earlier. It was the first novel he had written in almost 50 years so Winker himself was in his 80s. I hope I can write that much in my 80s. Ben Okri, the African writer, a novelist, I think primarily, said that it is Sawinka's greatest novel, his revenge against the insanities of the nation's ruling class and one of the most shocking chronicles of an African nation in the 21st century. It ought to be widely read. 
This is what I have read in addition to Suinka's lectures on reparations and uh, the South African experience of mm, truth and reconciliation. Uh, and I found it enchanting from the beginning. Uh, so I will definitely be taking Ben Okri's advice and reading this novel more over the next 12 months or so. 1987, Yosef, Joseph or Yusuf Brodsky from uh, Soviet Union or Russia or later America, the United States of America. He was a poet, wonderful poet. Uh, got a, his collected poems there, or selected poems there up to 1996. But also a wonderful essayist in here. His uh, essays on grief and reason are collected, including a fantastic uh, commencement address he gave in America. Uh, he uh, grew up and became a young man in Russia, but he was not well, didn't fit in, I guess, with the Soviet culture. He um, was very much taken under the wing of the great, I guess, dissident poet Anna Akhmatova. In the 1960s, despite his vocation as a poet, he really wrestled with the authorities. There was a great court case that followed the 1963 article in the Leningrad newspaper that described Brodsky's poetry as pornographic and anti-Soviet. His papers were confiscated. He was interrogated and actually twice put in a mental institution, uh, as well as being arrested and charged with social paras parasitism. He was forced to work odd jobs. It was a common experience then, often uh, jobs like being a stoker. And uh, the judge called him a pseudo-poet in velveteen trousers who had failed to to fulfil his constitutional duty to work honestly for the good of the motherland. The judge looked at him in the eye and asked him, who has recognised you, you as a poet? Who has enrolled you in the rank ranks of poets? And Brodsky replied, no one. Who enrolled me in the ranks of human of the human race? Uh, because of this sort of dissidence, he became a cause celeb in the West. Uh, and, uh, you know, transcripts of his trial were smuggled out. He became a symbol of symbolic resistance in a way like Anna Akhmatova, uh, his mentor herself. In 1972, it got even more serious. He was harassed again by the psychiatric institutions of the Soviet state, which then were used notoriously for uh, harassing uh, antisocial people and for political reasons. A psychiatrist, a notoriously politicised psychiatrist, Snezhnevsky, diagnosed Brodsky as having sluggishly progressing schizophrenia, <laughs> like pretty much the entire human race, and concluding that he was not a valuable person at all and may be let go. So he was let go by the Soviet Union, that he was expelled or strongly advised to emigrate, left the Soviet Union for the United States of America with the help of poets like W.H. Auden and other supporters. So he's awarding the award of the prize to uh, Brodsky in 1987 was again another um, uh, award of the prize to a Soviet dissident, I guess, uh, for an all-embracing authorship that was imbued with clarity of thought and poetic intensity. However, in Brodsky's case, the um, celebration of this Soviet Russian poet in exile was taken to an extreme because in 1991, his new country of the United States of America appointed him Poet Laureate. This, of course, in the year that the Soviet Union collapsed, quite a statement from the U.S. 
USA. I remember when I visited the Anna Akhmatova Museum in St. Petersburg, which is a wonderful literary museum. If you do go to St. Petersburg, I highly recommend you go there. And there uh, in uh, the room in the apartment was uh, Brodsky's desk brought back from his uh, American home to be in St. Petersburg in the same room with the furniture as his great mentor, the great, great Russian poet Anna Akhmatova. His poetry collections include A Part of Speech and To Urania and the essay collection uh, Less Than One. And that poem, which is one of his more famous ones, Poem to Urania, I'll just quickly read for you now. It's a quite a short poem. To Urania, yeah, in, in English, uh, everything has its limit including sorrow. A window pane stalls a stair, nor does a grill abandon a leaf. One may rattle the keys, gurgle down a swallow. Loneliness cubes a man at random. A camel sniffs at the rail with a resentful nostril. A perspective cuts emptiness deep and even. And what is space anyway, if not the body's absence at every given point? That's why Urania is older than sister Cleo, the muses. Uh, in daylight or with the soot-rich lantern, you see the globe's pate free of any bio. You see she hides nothing unlike the latter. There they are, blueberry-laden forests, rivers where the folk with bare hands catch sturgeon, or the towns in whose soggy phone books you are st starring no longer. Farther eastward surge on brown mountain ranges, wild mares carousing in tall sedge. The cheekbones get yellower as they turn numerous, and still farther east stem, steam dreadnoughts or cruisers, and the expanse grows blue like lace underwear. Written in 1981, nearly 10 years after his departure from Russia. Uh, I'd also really recommend his essays, uh, wonderful essayist, very witty. He wrote a brilliant essay on the condition of being an exile, which gently uh, made fun of uh, the many exiles of ex-Soviet states and in uh, the United States of America, as well as his wonderful commencement address in that collection, In Praise of Boredom, uh, a fine writer. Joseph Brodsky. The 1988 winner was Naguib Mahfouz from Egypt. Uh, he was one of the major writers in Arabic literature along with Taha Hussein in the 20th century. He published 35 novels, over 350 short stories, 26 screenplays, uh, hundreds of op-ed columns, for Egyptian newspapers and seven plays over a long career from the 1930s until 2004. His novels are all set in Egypt and include the Cairo trilogy and the children of Gebelawi. And his works have been made frequently into Egyptian and foreign films. In fact, he is the major Arab writer adapted for cinema and television. He grew up himself in a stern Muslim family and as a child witnessed the 1919 Egyptian revolution, which was revolting against British colonialism, the British Empire in the Middle East. Suez Canal and all that sort of thing. He saw British soldiers firing at the demonstrators in an effort to disperse them. And according to Mahfouz, you could say that the one thing which most shook the security of my childhood was the 1919 revolution. He studied philosophy, then became a writer, and then my own vocation he became a bureaucrat. He was a civil servant or public servant in the Egyptian uh, civil service until his retirement in the early 1970s. He enjoyed one of the nicer jobs of the bureaucracy, 
working in the culture ministry. Indeed, in the 1950s, he worked as the Director of Censorship in the Bureau of Arts and as the Director of the Foundation for the Support of the Cinema. So he is an important figure in Egyptian cultural and political life beyond just his writing. The Cairo Trilogy, his perhaps most famous work, depicts the lives of three generations of different families in Cairo from World War I until after the 1952 military coup that overthrew King Farouk. Uh, and these novels uh, were titled with street names Palace Walk, Palace of Desire and Sugar Street. He, um, This was... Mahfouz's Cairo, uh, the place in which he lived, in which he made his life, despite all the travails of colonialism and post-colonial difficulties, and uh, in which he, from which he rarely travelled. It's a wonderful trilogy that explores a family over three generations. He stopped writing after finishing the trilogy amidst the turmoil of 1950s uh, Egypt and did not really resume until his writing until 1959 after the Suez Canal crisis. Uh, and he stated in a 1998 interview that Nasser, uh, the leader of Egypt during the Suez Canal, 1956 Suez Canal crisis, which I made a video on, uh, he long felt that Nasser was one of the greatest political leaders in modern history. I only began to fully appreciate him after he nationalised the Suez Canal. He believed, really, I guess, in the politics of socialist Egyptian nationalism, uh, and yet he was not a Islamic fundamentalist. I guess he he defended uh, Salman Rushdie against the fatwa in the 1980s, uh, late 1980s, in the urging of him to be killed. Indeed, he suffered for that because in his belief that no blasphemy harms Islam and Muslims so much as the call for murdering a writer. But he was himself stabbed in 1994 by Muslim extremists. The novel I sampled was uh, Palace Walk, the first of the... Um, Cairo Trilogy, it begins with a brilliantly told story uh, that helps you enter the mind and feelings of Amina, who's married at 14 and subjected to her husband's uh, discipline, I guess. When I read it, I was immediately entranced by this novelist's skill and committed myself to read more. Uh, and I hope to be able to do that over the next year or so. And I hope you have explored or perhaps let me know more about what you enjoy about Nagib Mahfouz's writing. The start of the video that Gabriel Garcia Marquez won the 1982 Nobel Prize and his book 100 Years of Solitude is one of those great great books. It's one of those books that I have wanted to and tried to read for decades ever since Marquez's Nobel Prize uh, was awarded on the cusp of my adulthood. I've tried and failed, but thanks to doing this 120 Nobels Challenge, I have now learnt the story behind Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, the story that is the real history that actually inspired the story of 100 Years of Solitude. And I share that on my substack at jeffrich.substack. And you can actually also watch my voiced version of that story in this video right here. Thanks for watching.